what I'd like to do today is to describe to you the creation and development of a Native American photography collection that is in the National Anthropological Archives. And while you may not have heard of that organization, it's part of a much larger group of museums, the Smithsonian Institution, which I believe you have heard of, and specifically part of the Natural History Museum, uh, which is separate from the New Museum of American Indian. And to really address um, the history of the collections, we really have to go back to the beginning. In, in 1829, an Englishman by the name of James Smithson uh, left a bequest to the United States government to create an institution with the purpose of increasing and diffusing knowledge. That institution was finally uh, opened to the general public in 1855. And 1855 was a technologically <coughs> extremely exciting time. And before I start my slides, I'd, I'd like you to try and consider where they were at that time. First of all, imagine a world without photography. I mean, that's, it's almost impossible. There would be no TV, no video, no movies, no ads. No, we'll give you that one. But if, if there were books or newspapers, they could only be illustrated with drawings. And just imagine what you wouldn't know about the world and past events and past people. It's, imagine looking into a mirror for the first time and being able to take the image and walk away with it. I mean, that's how exciting it was to people at the time. And it's no real surprise that researchers and entrepreneurs grasped onto this and ran like crazy. And it was at exactly this time that the Smithsonian was created. And it became a center for many disciplines, um, as well as a repository for images, and also a gallery of art. And so that's the background and why the institution <coughs> was at, in effect, the right place at just the right time. Now, the earliest photographs were taken of delegates who did come to Washington, D.C. And it grew out of a tradition of artwork. Charles Bird King at the behest of the United States government <coughs> to document delegates that came to the capital in the 1820s. And by 1837, these were turned into um, lithographs, but the paintings were on display in the new Smithsonian Gallery of Art by the 1850s and later. Another um, artist who painted the delegates was Catlin. Um, this is a wonderful painting of an Indian by the name of The Light. And that's him on the right as the way he appeared when he came to Washington, D.C. And that's how he looked when he left, dressed in a uniform with an umbrella and carrying a bottle of whiskey and whistling Yankee Doodle, we're told. <laughs> but when photography came onto the scene, artists were really concerned that they would no longer have anything to do with we certainly know that that isn't a problem, but the photographers did pick up where the artists couldn't possibly keep um, the same kind of pace. Um, the earliest delegation photographs we have are a series of images with the daguerreotypes that were taken in 1851-1852. Uh, this is of a Cheyenne group after the Fort Laramie Treaty and it was made by a gentleman by the name of Fitzgibbon in St. Louis. Uh, later, this will be copied by a photographer by the name of Schindler, whom we'll discuss in a minute. The first real series of delegations, though, that were photographed were in 1857 and 1858. And you can see that they were coming in massively great numbers. Um, these were photographed, this is a delegation group by Brady, 
but the individual uh, delegates were photographed by um, James Earl MacLeese. Um, this is his portrait of Little Crow. Now at the time, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution was Joseph Henry, and he realized the importance of photographing the delegates, and he tried very hard to get the United States government to fund it, but it did not. Then one of the <coughs> defining moments happened in January of 1865. Uh, much of the Smithsonian Castle, this is the first building, uh, burnt up. And it destroyed a large percentage of those paintings by Charles Bird King. This is one of the few interior photographs that show all of those wonderful paintings that were destroyed. Again, Joseph, again, Joseph Henry tried to get um, money to replace the galleries with photography. Um, and he wasn't successful until he met an Eng another Englishman by the name of William Henry Blackmore. Now, Blackmore was a philanthropist who just adored the American West. And he provided all sorts of funding. He acquired the negatives that MacLeese had made of the 57, 58 delegates. Um, he provided funding for surveys. Uh, and in 1865, well, there's, that's Blackmore. Sorry about that. Um, in 1865, he published some of those images that were taken of those early delegations. <coughs> but one of the most important things that he did was he contracted photographers to record the Indians for the government, and he also went around the United States and collected early images. The man who is most critical at this point is a French artist turned photographer by the name of Antonio Zeno Schindler. Um, later, he ended up painting fish casts for the museum, and this is the only known portrait. And he had Schindler copy not only the daguerreotypes um, that were taken of the 51 52 delegations, um, this is his glass copy negative of Friday and Arapaho. Uh, the original daguerreotype is in the Smithsonian in another uh, section, but it has badly deteriorated where the glass plates are still quite beautiful. Schindler occupied the studio that had housed the McLeese studio, and so he had access to those negatives, but he was also a photographer, and after the Civil War, the delegations continued to come to the capital to negotiate. Uh, this is an 1867 delegation, a huge group portrait. And now Schindler is taking the photographs. This is one of his portraits that he made of a man by the name of Scarlet Knight, which sadly was, he was murdered during this delegation. Schindler also attempted the near impossible, which was photographing a dance. Clearly, this is posed, but it was um, quite technologically advanced at the time. Uh, in 1868, the delegations continued. This is um, a portrait of Keokuk in the second Fox delegation that was made by Matthew Brady. Uh, normally, this lecture has lots of stories about these images. You can you can just imagine, but. I promised Hartman I'd tell one story because I'm not going to talk about the headstands. But um, by the late 1860s, delegations were streaming into the capital. Uh, official ones, of course, but also unofficial ones. They really wanted to come to the capital. And they would get there, they would run out of money, and then they would have to use funds from who knows where, and you know what budgets are like, to take care of them to get them home. And so the Commissioner of Indian Affairs sent a notice to all those agents saying, whatever you do, stop these Indians from coming. And Keokuk, no one was going to stop him. And the agent desperately tried. He even had the whole group arrested and put in jail uh, in Fort Leavenworth. Um, but they were just traveling. They hadn't broken any rules and, or laws. And so they continued to the capital, whereupon they turned around and sued Wiley for false imprisonment. And 
$40,000. And just to make matters worse for the agent, um, there had been a change of administration. And so he was also out of a job. And the, the final insult was that the reason that the Indians wanted to come to the capital was to complain about Wiley being their agent. <laughs> so you see, it all, it all comes around. Things are bad. <laughs> but the next year, which is 1869, um, all of these images that are being gathered from the delegations are now put on exhibit in the museum. And as far as we can tell, it is the first exhibit of photography in a US museum. And it was by Schindler, and it included all these images. Um, this is the catalog. And I know it says 1867. It's an old typo. The, Im the images date from 1867, but it was actually published in 1869. While we're on the subject of delegation photographs, I can't leave out the fantastic photographs that were created by Alexander Gardner at the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, which are also in the collection. Also, in this exhibit um, was a few very early survey images. And this is one that was taken of a group of Arapaho um, on the Reynolds Expedition, which was in 1859 and 1860. And that leads us to another major category of images and the creation um, of the collection. In the 1870s, there were four great surveys that went out to um, discover the lands. And there was the King survey. Um, George Wheeler led a survey. William Bell was one of the photographers. But Timothy O'Sullivan, whom you may have heard of, he took this photograph on the right of Zuni in 1873, and that's the first photograph of Zuni by a survey photographer. In the Powell survey, which was the area south of the Rocky Mountain region, um, E. O. Beeman took this photograph in 1871. And as Jennifer was talking about how you have to research images, this is frequently circulated. And it was, in fact, circulated by Powell and Hillers as being by Hillers in 1874, called the Ute Warrior and His Bride. Um, it's actually a Ute man and boy, and it was by Beeman in three years earlier. Um, and <coughs> Hillers took this photograph of Powell. He was out in the Paiute and Ute region. But this is one of the survey images that I really wanted to mention, and Alita had referred to this yesterday. They did want to document the native cultures, but they also realized that there was a financial incentive to sell the images, and they wanted pretty images. Um, the year before, Powell had collected the dress this, uh, this pirate woman is wearing. And it is a ute dress. And right there, you can see the museum accession number. He brought it back, and then he took it back in the field, and she posed with it. Um, the object must have remained in the field because we have only the catalog card now. Uh, who knows? It, it'll probably turn up on eBay or something. Um, the last of the four great surveys was the Hayden survey, and the photographer on that was the famous photographer William Henry Jackson. And in 1871, he photographed this Bannock group of sheep eater. And this is a group of Pawnee at Luke Fork. And Walpi in um, 1876. Now, Jackson had access to not only all of the delegation glass plate negatives, but now all of the negatives that were being created by all these surveys. And the Schindler catalog had cataloged the first 300 images. And then Jackson proceeded to recatalog them because, as you know, images keep coming in. You have to keep recataloging them in a new format. 
And so, in 1874, he did a very quick listing while he was with the USGS of the territories. And then in 1877, he produced his major catalog. And many of you may not realize it, but if you've seen images of Native Americans with numbers on them, those numbers frequently relate to that catalog. But in 1879, the US government decided that instead of funding four separate surveys that were competing for money every year, uh, they would combine them all into the US Geological Survey. But they also created an organization called the Bureau of American Ethnology, which was to be the repository for all of the artifacts and all of the images, and also to continue the work um, that was uh, done by the different researchers out in the field. The BAE then assumed the leadership role in, US, uh, in the U.S. for American uh, anthropology. One of those was a man by the name of Frank Hamilton Cushing, who went to Zuni and tried to become very much part of the culture. Uh, this is a glass plate negative that was made by Hillers. This is an 1879 uh, stereo photograph of a basket dance. And in 1882, uh, Cushing brought a group of elders to the East Coast. Um, and this was taken at that time. And they also were taken to the Bureau of American Ethnology, uh, where they recorded some linguistic material. <coughs> the Bureau also had archaeologists and Cosmos and Victor Mindeleff were out at Casa Grande in 1891. And these photographs now started to join the other photographs in the collection. But what was important at this time was a great technological leap. Instead of glass plate technology, you had film. And anyone could now take photographs, even the anthropologists. And so you get anthropologists that can now go anywhere they want and at least attempt to t take an image of something that they want. Um, this is Alice Fletcher, and she was working with Jane Gay with the Nez Perce in the 1890s. Uh, this is Frances Dinsmore making a recording from Mountain Chief of Blackfoot. And this is the redoubtable Matilda Cox Stevenson and May Clark taking photographs of the Shalico at Zuni in the late 1890s. The Bureau did also hire men, and one of them was James Mooney, and he recorded the Cherokee. Most people know him for his work um, in 1891 with the Ghost Dance. These images are all in that collection. And in 1893, this Hopi dance. But the BAE, that's the Bureau of American Ethnology, also continued to take photographs of delegations that came to Washington, D.C. And while they weren't negotiating treaties, they were still coming to the Capitol. The Bureau's photographer, Delancey Gill, took this photograph of um, no liver in Oto. And you can see that now we have a plain background, and clearly these are being taken for physical anthropological reasons. You get front and side views. Smiley, another Smithsonian photographer, took this Yankton group in 1904. And Delancey Gill took this photograph of hollow horn bear. Now, the Bureau was responsible for distributing images around the world and to whatever repository or individuals wanted them, uh, researchers or collectors or whatever. But they were also used for other purposes, for example, as the basis for this 1922 stamp. Um, it contracted with Frank Reinhardt to take photographs at the Trans-Mississippi International Exposition. And this is a turning point, um, again, with technology changing, professional photographers have to have a different angle to distinguish their work from the general populace. Um, this is a rather standard portrait, uh, but it was taken by Adolf Muir, who eventually worked with Curtis. So you start to see a little bit more artistic things coming in. And then you get this wildly crazy mock battle. 
Um, but the, the Bureau, by all accounts, the Indians had an absolutely fantastic time at the exposition. <coughs> and James Mooney had an absolutely wretched time because he wasn't getting the ethnological views that he wanted and everybody was just having fun. And so that's why they mollified Mooney by having those dull portraits made. And they were then put in the collections. But the Bureau doesn't just collect um, from its in-house researchers. It also collects from external uh, donors and documents everything from archaeology, um, early reservation life, wars, and it's a worldwide collection that now numbers about a half million images. The artistic images, uh, again, we have some of the Dixon Wanamaker photographs, and of course we had to include the Hopi images from Curtis, but there are also some unknown photographers, or lesser known photographers, I should say, uh, like John Anderson, and this is his magnificent photograph of he Dog. And Sumner Madison, who with his Kodak camera and his bicycle, traveled around taking photographs of wonderful places and people and his flute ceremony. In 1965, the Bureau of American Ethnology was phased out of existence, and it was its work and collections were joined with the Department of Anthropology in the Smithsonian. And at that point, the National Anthropological Archives took over the name. Um, what we do is we continue to try to preserve all the images and arrange and describe them. And of top priority to us, though, is our outreach program. And the museum has several programs dealing with Native American communities. Um, and many of our images are also on the web. I'll, I'll give you information about that. Uh, and we, too, continue to collect. We're proud that Gary Auerbach's photographs have also joined our collection. And I look forward to open dialogues with everyone about the collections and in any way that we can help. Thank you.